Hello, everyone, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to this Centre for Policy Studies event, uh, kindly supported by the, by the ABI, on Can the City Seize the Opportunities of, of Brexit? Um, and the, Charlotte, to my left, has just, just pointed out that the, the, the aesthetics are slightly like a cage fright, uh, given the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the so, so, so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see uh, Bim and, and Gareth and Gerald all, all wrestling intellectually um, as, the, as the hour goes on. Um, but no, thank you for, for very much for joining us, and thank you to our, to our brilliant panel. Um, from right to left, perhaps not in, in that order of political stances, uh, Bim Afalami MP, uh, Gerald Lyons, who is the... Uh, Senior economist at now, well, is it? Uh, or, uh, yeah, economist. Economist. Uh, um, uh, I'm Robert Colville. I'm, I'm not Tom Clockerty, who unfortunately isn't, isn't able to jo join us today. Then we have um, Charlotte Clark of the ABI, and finally, Gareth Davis, MP. So, yeah, plenty to go yeah, at. Yeah, um, and I'm just really, uh, we should just really crack straight on. Um, as ever, in the second half of the uh, event, you will be asking questions from the audience. We'll have microphones that go around. So please have a, have a good think about, about what you want to ask the panel. But um, Charlotte, let's start with you. Can the city seize the opportunities of Brexit? And if so, how? Oh, thanks, Robert. And, and many thanks for all of you for attending. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to be well, working with the CPS and, and being on this panel. Uh, yeah. As the, as, the, as the Financial Services and Markets Bill kind of makes its way into committee, uh, for those of us who are interested in Financial Services and Markets Bills, I mean, you get one about every 15 years. So I guess in answer to the question, if we don't seize the opportunity now, uh, it's going to be quite a long time before we see one again. Um, just a quick bit about the ABI. I mean, obviously we represent the insurance industry, which uh, we like to think is the exciting part of financial services. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I think the pension funds are giving you a run for your money uh, this <laughs> indeed, week. Indeed, they are. Um, uh, but you know, in terms of uh, you know an important part of the UK economy, I mean, we, we employ over three hundred thousand people, and over two thirds of them are outside London. We are the fourth biggest insurance industry in the world, and the largest within Europe. So it's a it's a massive part of the infrastructure of the financial services of London and the UK. Um, the things I wanted to talk about, mostly, I guess, you know, given the focus on growth, given the focus around solvency too, uh, I understand some of my colleagues are running a small sweepstake as to how many times solvency too will be mentioned within this panel. Um, you know, the focus on investment and the importance of investment within the UK economy, I don't think it's ever been greater. Uh, as institutional investors, one of the things that we want to, to look at is how you can adapt the rules that are currently from Europe, the Solvency II rules, about making investment opportunities for Sorry. institutional Sorry. investors. Sorry. Fine. Uh, institutional investors, it's just slightly different. So to be a, at the moment, it's harder to invest in a wind farm than it is to invest in a coal mine. And that can't be right. So the fact that we're at this moment where we can you know, review the rules and think about them, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to make sure that we take. Um, in terms of the, the review of Solvency 2, I mean, the, the, the government has kind of laid out three uh, objectives around it, and it's very difficult to argue with any of them. One is about making sure that we have a vibrant industry. One is making sure that we do not undermine policyholder protection, and that third one is around investment. It's the investment one that gets most of the attention, but actually all three of them are incredibly important. And what is also kind of really important to kind of note is we are not the only people reviewing Solvency 2 at the moment. The EU is, is reviewing Solvency 2. It has been in for the last five years. It is, it is a natural time for us to be reviewing these things. It's really important that whatever we do here in the UK ensures that the UK can be competitive for the next generation. Rather than make, you know, uh, uh, rather than kind of putting us at a disadvantage, and I, you know, without getting into the details of some of the options, you know, it's really important that we make sure that we, we take that opportunity to to put investment at the heart of what insurers do, and to ensure that we can make those investments in infrastructure uh, as part of of the approach that insurers want to take, particularly given the role of insurers when it comes to climate, you know, climate and net zero still remain you know, the biggest challenge uh, in this country across the world. And the investment that's required to move towards it is, is one of the great challenges, I think, for the financial services sector. 
for the next few years and ensuring that actually we rise to the challenge of ensuring that private sector funding is there to be able to kind of move towards net zero. Um, talk very, very shortly about the Financial Services and Markets Bill because I think you know, that's about the framework and making sure that the framework is right between the different parts of the regulatory system, between the regulators, between the executive, making sure that the checks and balances are, are right. You know, one of the things that we have been arguing for is that there is a primary objective on uh, uh, regulators to, uh, to take account of competitiveness and economic growth. In the bill at the moment, it, it argues for a secondary objective, which is fine as long as it means that it changes the behaviours of the regulators. The regulators have taken on immense powers from Europe and it's important that in making the trade-offs that they make, nobody wants to undermine financial stability, nobody wants to undermine security or policyholder protection. That is our business. Um, but it's about making sure these things are balanced with decisions around economic growth. Um, so I will stop there and I will pass on to... Uh, I, th I think it's Bim next. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. And uh, sorry, I should have just reminded our panel that we are being streamed to a, a global audience of dozens. Maybe hundreds. Maybe hundreds. Um, so, um, so, 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 don't, don't, don't say anything that you wouldn't want to ha have preserved for, for posterity. Uh, Bim. Great. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Um, when we consider this question, the first thing we've got to ask ourselves is, what are we actually trying to do? And in my mind, we should be trying to do two things. The first thing is to attract as much money, investment, uh, and growth to the UK financial services sector. That's job one. But job two is to ensure that that money and investment doesn't just stay there and get recycled out somewhere else. It actually improves the wealth of this country. And that means the people of this country in all parts of the country. So they're the two jobs. How, how are we doing on these, on these metrics? On the first, um, I think there's some good, some less good. I, don't, I think we've been slow over the last few years to recognize the threat that the European Union has posed to our financial services sector. I'll be very frank with you. When we are part of something as integrated and as deep as the European Union, with a very powerful regulator, with a pool of capital that is, or rather with a, with, a, with a greater number of countries that is much bigger than our own, the ECB has a lot of power over even British firms, and they are using that power every single month, every single year, to try and make it harder and harder for European business to be in the UK. That's just a fact, and we have to accept that. But there is a great opportunity with that because there is a much wider world out there there is more and more capital in Asia, growing amounts in Africa, and obviously you've got the economy of the United States, which, though it has its own financial services sector based in New York, needs London as well. So we need to remember, or rather for some people, really accept that we are in a global competition, not just one with Europe, but we need to accept that some of that European business isn't coming back, it's going to become harder, and we need to reach out further, particularly to Asia and Africa as well. What does that... Um, what does that look like? We've, we'll probably end up talking a lot about regulators, and I'm the first one to complain about regulators. I'm a conservative. I don't really like rules. They're annoying. They stop you doing things. But actually, because of, as, as we've already heard, the amount of power that we've now given regulators that has come from the European Union after we've left, in effect, what we've done with the Financial Service and Markets Bill, and I've said this in the House of Commons many times, so I don't mind saying it to the thousands, gazillions of global um, watchers of this panel, is that we've given them power largely not with no more accountability at all. We have said to the regulators, right, you, 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 um, we're giving you all these powers, and the Treasury Select Committee will call you for a meeting every so often, um, and we hope that um, you'll do it properly, and the Treasury will meet you on a relatively regular basis and see how you're doing. I think we need much more democratic accountability for the regulators as to how they behave because often, and for those of you in this room who represent or you know, work for financial services firms, these guys are judge and jury. And I think it's no secret to know that you know, there are certain issues with how um, the FCA has dealt with certain institutions over recent months. Uh, and. You know, I'm not blaming anybody at the FCA, but maybe it's just they're overworked or overwhelmed. But 
if there are mistakes made or things that are done that are just not in a pro-enterprise, pro-growth, pro-British direction, we need members of parliament, uh, and indeed the House of Lords as well, to be able to scrutinise that and call that out. And I think we need much stronger uh, accountability for our regulators to strengthen the financial services sector. And then, so that's to deal with making our, to attract more and more um, business to the UK. The second point around how do we actually ensure that once we've done a wonderful job of increasing the amount of investment um, to this country's financial services sector, how do we make sure this actually contributes to wealth and growth in this, own, in this country? I think that levelling up is really important. That means we need to continue to support big financial services institutions who, who, to move more senior roles outside of London. At the moment, we're seeing, I think it's um, two-thirds of roles are outside London, but they tend to be more junior back office roles. Let's support them to put more senior roles in places like this own city where we are now in Birmingham. I think we should do that. We should also change some of our rules around equity and debt finance so that we can prioritize equity financing of businesses, help flow some of that capital, not just into lending through banks in a traditional bank lending way, but recognize that equity can be just, if not better, for a lot of small businesses as well, so we can help them scale and develop and grow. So we need to, not, we need to remember that, yes, London is the heart of our financial services sector, but this whole country needs to benefit from the new British financial services sector. And if we can do that, as well as getting in more and more investment, we'll be in a better place. And yes, we, we need more accountability for the regulators. Thank you very much. Um, Gareth, uh, anything to add to that tour de force from him? Uh, yeah, that was a, a very compre typically comprehensive uh, overview. But let but. me first um, say <laughs> <clears throat> what a pleasure it is that we're having a panel with such a large audience on financial services because it is genuinely the jewel in the crown of our economy. And too often, actually, in Parliament, we shy away from championing it, from being proud of it, and from saying that actually financial services is the solution to a lot of our problems in our country, in our world, um, not, not the cause of it. And whether you look at infrastructure, the infrastructure fi financing gap, whether you look at financial inclusion uh, as an issue, whether you look at our climate targets, financial services, uh, for the most part, have a lot of the answers that we need. Um, BIM has talked about regulation uh, in depth. I think the Financial Services Bill, by the way, if you're not familiar with it yet, it is. it does represent, I think, probably the largest change in regulation in a generation uh, and really does fully capture the opportunities presented uh, by Brexit. But let me just uh, focus on two areas, capital and people. There is more we can do, for sure in terms of unlocking more private capital for public good. And we've had, uh, let me add to the, 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 the list on uh, Solvency 2, um, but we can unlock more private capital from pension funds, uh, from those who save and invest. We can unlock more from insurance companies as we'll go on to. But we need to do that to bolster what we call our scale-up. Uh, initiative in this in this country. It's actually a great country to set up a business. It's a really good com uh, country to uh, invest in venture capital. But as soon as companies get to a certain size, they head off to New York. They head off to the United States. 63% of all of our uh, businesses that uh, in technology who who scale up, 63% comes from overseas. I want to see more of our our private investors in this country uh, fueling and funding. Uh, those growth uh, companies. The other thing I would just say on people is that we have some of the most talented, uh, impressive people working in our FS industry in the world. Uh, but that has to be a continual improvement. And that's why I'm a strong advocate of a global talent visa advocated by uh, Ron Khalifa in his review of FinTech. I think if we can get smarter about how we bring people into this country, uh, I think we can remain strong in the world. And finally, I think we need to democratize our capital markets a lot better than we are. That means bringing younger people into capital markets through extending auto-enrollment to 18 to 22 year olds, get them on the savings and investment <coughs> ladder, uh, and also looking at advice and how we broaden the scope of advice so that more people who are investing, who are saving, uh, have more advice uh, available to them. Not necessarily through recommendations, but through guidance 
uh, and I think there's a lot of work to do on that. But I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Gerard. Um, well, good afternoon. Yeah, in terms of roles, I should say, uh, given we're talking about the city, I'm a shareholder and strategist with Net Wealth. We're an online discretionary wealth manager, so we manage people's pensions. I'm also on the board of Bank of China here in the UK and on the board of BGC, the interdealer brokers. I'd like to talk about three different areas, growth, regulators, and risk. Um, first, growth. I think the government's um, pro-growth agenda is an excellent one. I think it's about time it moved to centre stage in our economic debate. The fact it hasn't been centre stage is staggering. Since the 2008 global financial crisis, all of Western Europe, including the UK, has suffered from a weak growth environment. Often in the UK, there's a tendency to talk about Brexit being the reason, but it's interesting, I noticed Dr. Graham Gudgeon produced a report the other day saying since the Brexit referendum, until the latest data, one looks at cumulative growth rates. France is 6.9% up, Britain 6.8% up, Germany 4.5% up, and Italy 2.8% up. So we've actually outperformed some of the big countries on the continent. There's a tendency, if you focus on the wrong issue, you get the wrong solution. And so our low growth issue is linked to many things. Low tax is not the answer to this, it's part of the answer maybe, but it's about more investment, more innovation, more infrastructure, as well as the incentives. But the point is that the city plays a key role, both directly and indirectly, if we're to play, or if we're to achieve that pro-growth result of 2.5% trend growth, which is ambitious, but not exceptional. Now the city, <clears throat> We tend to talk about finance, but it's about professional services and also law. Law is a key positive ingredient for Britain post-Brexit. The city itself is a whole of UK success story, as BIM has touched on. It's vital for the levelling up agenda and vital in terms of providing finance to the regions. Um, so the city itself is directly, is the role it plays directly in terms of being competitive internationally and indirectly the role it plays in the UK. The final point to say on growth though is that the government maybe was forced to talk about bankers' bonuses. I understand from reading the press that that might have been leaked. Whereas bankers' bonuses are only part of the story about making the UK city competitive. Uh, we need to compete with other centres in New York, uh, Singapore, etc. But it's about not only bankers' bonuses but about the issues I'm about to talk about in the second part. So the first point is the pro-growth agenda is the right one. I think the city plays the role directly in terms of trying to become more competitive and indirectly we need to actually provide more finance. Just to give some weight or figures around the finance, the Macmillan Gap identified in 1931 that there was a shortfall between the finance that business want, wanted and banks provided. Back in 2019, the Bank of England commissioned the Future Finance Report, and in response to that, they identified that there was a funding gap of £22 billion. The tendency uh, within the UK policy circles has often been to think that this is a demand problem, but many small businesses think it's a supply problem. Solving that is part of achieving the pro-growth agenda. Second is on regulation. Look, for a financial centre to be competitive, it needs really three things. It needs deep and broad markets. It needs to be the place that clients want to do business. And it needs to have a regulatory environment that helps the sector grow. Post 2016, given the question was about Brexit, we had a, an approach of benign neglect towards the city. The government seemed to think the city would look after itself. Therefore, the city, amazingly, despite the fact it's one eighth almost of the UK economy, did not figure in the so-called withdrawal agreement. We then had this situation where there was a desire to have equivalence at all costs, even though we were effectively equivalent to the rest of the EU, for political reasons, the EU did not grant equivalence. Now the realization is there that we need to not diverge for divergence sake, but actually have a bespoke regulatory environment that suits the UK to its best. It might be in line with other countries, it might be divergent. We are, it should be stated, moving to a more fragmented global environment, whereas it was very fragmented post-2008, it's now becoming more, uh, sorry, 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 not, post-2008 was converging to agreement on most things, now it's becoming more and more fragmented. 
Now, what does that mean? In terms of the regulatory environment, after 2008, the pendulum very much swung from one extreme to another, from too light to maybe too heavy. Uh, the regulators really didn't want to repeat of 2008. That was understandable. Uh, therefore, uh, the feeling is that they, become, they became excess, excessively cautious. Then post-2016, the regulators have had to absorb a lot more responsibility that was there on the continent before. So we now have complexity and scale and caution all into one. I think we need to be conscious of overloading the regulators with too much statutory obligations and overlapping competencies. But to give you one example, the FCA has three objectives, eight principles and seven just regards to government policy, so it is far too complex. But we need to avoid having a situation where there's too much subjectivity and too much discretion, otherwise it's hold, hard to hold anyone to account. And if we give all the regulators the same objective, there's gonna be a lack of sort of clear ownership. So the bespoke environment really does need to emerge. Now, a Khalifa report was mentioned, we've had some other excellent reviews post-Brexit or in recent years, Hills and Austin in particular are often mentioned, two of the main reviews on financial regulation. Their overarching theme is that the UK needs a regulatory environment that works in practice as well as in theory. I would argue the government needs calling powers to counter, as a counterweight to the powers of the regulators. We need to make sure that competition is up there in terms of what the regulators have to take into account. And we need to have a new approach that basically the politicians very much buy into, and as you said, accountability, although Parliament itself needs to probably review how it assesses uh, the city. And finally, in this area, we need to recognise that one of the big underlying strengths of the UK is English common law. Part of the worry about some of the regulations going through at the moment is that EU law has superseded UK common law, and that's a potential problem. The third area is about managing risk. Um, this is partly because I was asked so much about LDIs, liability deferred, defined investments this morning about the pension funds, and it was making me think, look, we've, we have this situation in the UK where we don't, it seems to me, have anyone at the centre, not that there's one person at the centre that should do this, but a way of managing risk. Like, take the currency, not we have a floating currency, but the bank and the treasury don't seem to think it's their responsibility, the markets, um, naturally use the currency as a shock absorber. Um, inf inflation, we have index linked debt, um, which um, obviously as RPI, retail price index inflation goes up, more payment on that. But we sh if you were running a fund yourself, you'll be thinking, let's um, hedge that inflation risk. But last week we had a situation which shocked um, in terms of the pension funds. Now, the backdrop for this is that since 2008, we've relied on cheap money. Cheap money basically has led to asset price inflation. Um, it's led to financial markets not pricing fully for risk. It's led to inefficient allocation of capital, zombie companies not going out of business, productive companies not being able to raise finance. It's led to an environment in which inflation has taken hold. And it's led to a situation where we've not really focused on supply side and other issues to drive economic growth We've always relied on the central bank, the Bank of England, and indeed other countries did the same, to step in and sort problems out. Now, last week, it was the scale and the speed at which interest rates rose that exposed the pension funds. But the root cause of the problem goes back to 2004, when the Pension Fund Act was changed, the Pension Act was changed. And pension fund liabilities, um, pension funds prior to that had best endeavour, you would have your best endeavour to meet your future liabilities. And of course that was their aim. Then it became a hard line on your balance sheet. So much so that if you had a deficit on your future liabilities, you had to stomp up and actually close that deficit gap. Clearly company balance, uh, pension schemes suddenly found that a problem. It became a problem that was really exacerbated when we suddenly moved to low interest rates because hedging interest rate risk can flood all other risks. So the pension fund, I don't know if any of you know people who are trustees on pension funds, they tend to meet four times a year, they're all very nice people, I'm sure, uh, but I'm not saying that all of them are necessarily experts. So they tend to buy consultants in to advise them. And I'm sure the consultants um, are very nice people as well. 
Uh, but basically what we had is the pension funds then hedged their risk um, through these um, LDIs. And the challenge is that it was a, effectively a leveraged play for done in all honesty, but it was a consequence of changes, regulatory changes made and interest rates starting to move up. Now the question is, you see, as the collateral on these payments had to increase, the pension funds then had to sell their gilts to actually get some money, but they were selling gilts into a falling market. But the reason for mentioning it in this context is that after something like this happens, and the phrase I used this morning was, or in the Sunday Telegraph yesterday, was in the financial crisis um, in the States, Warren Buffett said, it's only when the tide is out you can see who's swimming naked. Now, the point is that we get used to an environment of low rates, but it's only when the problem happens you then say, why didn't anyone spot it? Well, we have the PRA oversight of banks and insurance companies, the FCA have oversight of asset managers, and the pensions regulator has oversight of pension funds. So no one has overall sight of the ecosystem itself. And even though people might be aware, no one has responsibility. So I think a third issue that really comes to the fore, particularly as we move to a new economic environment, if the city is to be truly uh, competitive, and if we're to mitigate these worries that clearly have emerged in New York and other centres about the policy environment in the UK, I think we need to look at how risk is managed, systemic risk, collective risk within the system. So three issues. One, growth agenda, very positive. I think the city itself has a role to play by directly becoming more competitive. It is the second most competitive financial centre in the world, but New York is pulling ahead of us in my view. We're facing tough regulatory environment from politically motivated regulators, according to some in the city on the continent. Uh, but the city can also indirectly play a role by more finance to parts of the UK, closing those funding gaps. The second area is the regulator and risk and how we can change. Uh, the regulatory environment can change completely. And third, I would say managing the risk across the system as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try and maximise um, time, for, time for questions. So I'll only, only ask one of my own, but a, a sort of fairly wide one, which is... Obviously, some things have happened in the last uh, couple of weeks, um, as various people have alluded to. Not just the, the turmoil in the markets, but the, um, the announcement of the banker's bonus cap, the, um, the promise of a further deregulatory package uh, for financial services on top of the financial services market spill, which, which actually remarkably went through without a vote. Um, so even Labour must think that this, this stuff is a good idea. But how does, how, 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 what has changed in the last two, 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 two weeks or so in terms of the city and its... The, well, and, 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 and seizing opportunities and whether that's become um, easier, harder, more optimistic, more pessimistic. Um, and whoever wants to go first, really. <laughs> I'll go, fine. Um, I think that what's changed is there is clearly a renewed, probably stronger commitment to city competitiveness with the new administration, but that is potentially n balanced out against a greater wariness in the public about such activity. What we don't know yet is almost where that balance will end up. I was struck by the reaction to the, to the banker's bonuses cap. Regardless of whatever people think, it, is clearly, it was clearly something that made us less competitive in the eyes of the world, where we were one of the very few jurisdictions to do it. But the reaction to it, perhaps because it was wrapped up with all sorts of other things that, as we've seen this morning, um, proved less than popular. And what that has meant is that I fear that almost the, the well's been a bit poisoned for financial services uh, deregulation in a sensible way. I hope that isn't the case, but that is how I would analyze the last couple of weeks. I, th I think one of the challenges is not many people understand financial regulation. <laughs> you shocked me. <laughs> and so, you know, some of the rhetoric that's used around financial regulation about, you know, kind of tearing up the, the rule book or, you know, scrapping regulations, I mean, that's rarely what's actually being discussed. What's frequently being discussed is some very archaic, <laughs> very precise kind of rules. 
And, you know, if you look at something like Solvency 2, what we're arguing for is almost exactly what has happened in Europe. You know, it's no change to the matching adjustment. So, you know, it's changes to eligibility and to, to bring in new asset classes, which, you know, as we, I said before about, you know, having it easier to invest in wind farms rather than coal mines seems to be a very obvious thing to do. Um, you know, it, it's, not about, it's not about this great release. It's more about an evolution. And I think most people in financial services, I mean, I think Bim's right. It, it's slightly worrying in terms of, what we want to see is, is you know, ch some changes, but at the same time, it's about making sure that those are measured and, and thoughtful, and that they do lead to competitiveness. Um, you know, because you, we we do only have one chance to get this right in terms of the financial services and markets bill, uh, and you know, if, if if we somehow miss that opportunity, it, it won't come around again quickly. Mm. I'll just say, in terms of the um, lack of controversy, if I can put it that way, on the financial services markets bill, it is a bill based on a significant amount of work and engagement with industry, as well as a number of reviews, like the Wholesale Markets Review, the Hill Review, excellent reviews, excellent engagement, and uh, you know, it really is a substantive piece of work over, over a couple of years. Um, and what I would say about the last two weeks great credit to our new Prime Minister and the Chancellor. I think they've had several meetings with industry leaders uh, in terms of financial services. The Prime Minister in New York met with all the leaders of major New York financial services firms. That's it's exactly what we should be doing um, and, uh, and haven't done enough of, quite frankly, in, in history. So I have a great deal of confidence that this new administration will be, uh, you know, not just appreciates the sector but will engage uh, on an ongoing basis yeah I was going to say it's also about context and relevance it needs to be made relevant to general pe general public um, for instance um, your man from the state Frank Blunt who was here yesterday talking about supply side agenda he said the general public doesn't understand supply side and I would agree so I would say you talk about the four eyes investment innovation infrastructure incentives maybe people don't understand those but it's more easier to understand than supply side. But when it comes to the city, uh, there is a complete gap between um, where people are. We often talk from an institutional framework. Um, so financial literacy has been an issue now for 25 years. Um, it's also linked to numeracy deficiencies. Uh, one of the big issues, net wealth in the market, we're in um, advising people. Um, servicing the advice gap I think it is or basically there's a big advice gap between the advice people receive and what they should be given fees for instance our fees are very low so I'm plugging the company obviously here but, but it's amazing people don't really understand the importance of fees and I think it's partly linked to the fact that in the UK everything is focused on property people buy property you get on the property ladder you then scale down at the end and that's your pension so we need to have a real change in terms of how we view the financial sector and rising property prices is not always good news um, interest rates going up shouldn't always be seen as bad news but obviously it depends where you are to begin with but the, we need to have a change in terms of the whole discussion about this would be my point well if we can uh, move to, to audience questions and um, the, the guys with the mics um, can can mm. run around okay well that's a um, just, sorry. Uh, um, we start with the, the, the lady here and then the, the gentleman next to her, why not? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is actually just in relation to what Dr. Gerard Lyons has just said. Um, obviously, George Osborne did quite a lot in terms of increasing the ISO allowance, trying to get more people to save um, in stocks and shares. Um, and then we're obviously Margaret Thatcher's reforms from many, many years ago. What can we do to democratise um, share ownership or ownership of other financial assets? Read the excellent CPS report that we are working on on this very issue, but um, others may have views in the interim before the, the final word appears. Uh. All right. Well, um, quite simply, we need to make it tax not just tax efficient, but tax beneficial for companies to give their employees share ownership. We need to really prioritize that. <clears throat> to follow on from what Gerard was saying about how people just invest in property, 
not only is that risky from a sort of systemic perspective for the for the country it also means that the only people who get access to really high performing investments are people who are already rich like the people who invest in net wealth which has already got more than its fair share of mentions today but you know actually it is a bonkers system where in order to invest in a private equity fund in order to invest in a successful fast going business broadly speaking you need to already have a sufficient amount of capital. Ordinary people don't get a chance to get access to this stuff. And guess what? Those people get richer and richer. We need to make it normal and tax beneficial for companies of whatever size to give shares to the people who work for them. Can I just add as well, I mentioned earlier, I think getting people on the savings and investment or adder, if I can put it like that, is, is going to be really important. And a quick way of doing that is to extend auto enrollment to 18 to 22 year olds at the moment it kicks in at 22 if you just look at the last 10 years since it was implemented we've got 10 million more people saving and investing for retirement a 50 percent increase in participation among 20 to 29 year olds and what that does is it just gets them thinking about what to do with their money earlier on and i think that's one uh, critical thing that we can do we're in a stronger position today than we ever have been because not only are we a global leader in fintech, the technology that we have available to us on our phones now to be able to look at stocks and shares and look at where our money's going uh, is, is better than it's ever been. And so I have great confidence. We just need to uh, have a bit more of a nudge uh, to school kids as they're growing up uh, about the importance of investing, importance of saving and, and what stock, stocks and shares are all about. But as I say, in terms of policy, Auto enrollment extension would help with that a massive amount. Uh, yeah. I was going to concur with that. One area that probably I would, if I can sneak in at end here, is patient capital as well. It's not only the domestic, it's how small businesses, given what's just been said. Patient capital is about the availability of long term finance for growing innovative firms to scale up. And to really get a competitive edge internationally, you need that domestic funding to be available. So I think people need to see it in terms of what they can save day to day. Uh, technology will allow people to, to do that, as well as in terms of patient capital itself to get small businesses really innovative. Cool. Um, Charlotte, unless you want to go in, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid every single person answering every single question, because otherwise we won't get um, enough questions in. Uh, the gentleman there. Thanks, uh, Nick Taylor from Luna, uh, British FinTech. Um, we've been a world leader in FinTech for 10 years or so, second only to investment to the States. How can we ensure we retain that for the next 10, 15 years um, and for the technology of the future? Because on crypto, for one example, Singapore's had enabling legislation since 2019, the White House took an executive order earlier this year, the Europeans have got legislation about to hit the statute book, whereas in the UK, we've had the promise of a consultation in the coming months for three years. And then on FinTech, the Khalifa review, a key recommendation was getting CFIT off the ground. Two years later, that hasn't happened. How can we ensure we keep the crown for the next 10 years? Do you want to comment on that? Well, I was going to say it's a key issue because much of the regulatory debate is very backward looking. What we need to do is not that we can identify these new areas, but we need to actually be very much positioned to act far quicker. The UK has done very well in different well, green finance always used to be talked about in the UK also was mentioned earlier that's an important one but you're right cryptocurrency is digital space all, the, all of the above yes um, but I, I think it comes back to whether the regulators are burdened and too uh, cautious but you're right we need to be far more forward looking absolutely thanks um, uh, a couple from over here Uh, James Bolton Jones from the charity uh, Spotlight on Corruption. So as well as seizing the opportunities of Brexit, should we be thinking a bit more about the risks of further opening up our economy and the possibility that this could further facilitate the flow of illicit finance, um, that kleptocrats, drug traffickers and other serious organised criminals seek to launder through our financial system? And if panellists accept that these risks exist, uh, what can we do to mitigate them? Thanks. Okay, well, we have um, an economic crime bill that uh, is, is uh, I think, already drafted and, and, and on its way, hopefully. Um, let me just try and tie what you 
just asked with what you just asked about, if I can. Because one of the main vehicles and mechanisms for uh, fraud and, and for illicit finance is through crypto, I'm afraid. And we as, uh, as policymakers and the regulator needs to really carefully look at how crypto is being used for, for, for bad purposes, as well as providing protection for vulnerable customers. Uh, and I think this is one of the issues that will dominate the agenda, the policy agenda over the next few years, how we grapple with crypto and how we harness the opportunities it perhaps presents, but make sure that we protect the citizens and ensure that it's, they're not being, it's not being used for illicit purposes is going to be critical. The United States are doing a tremendous amount on this um, through Gary Gensler, the, the chair of the SEC, and they're you know, vastly increasing their headcount who are looking at this within the regulator. One of the challenges our regulator has is being able to get the expertise to be able to monitor the development of this technology. Um, and I wait to see what they do about this because I genuinely think this is going to become a big issue in public policy and for consumer duty. Um, the gentleman behind, and then we'll move over to uh, Richard Birch, Chief Executive of the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, it's a question for the two non-politicians, really, and it's about regulation. Uh, during foot, uh, during foot and mouth, sorry, during COVID, um, <laughs> I was very noticeable how the HSE, the, often the butt of regulation, changed its posture hugely, and for small businesses became hugely uh, accepting of providing advice and guidance, not simply the rules. Is there a place for our financial regulators adopting more of a role in advising and encouraging rather than simply being a policeman and judge? It's very hard to argue against that, isn't it? Um, you know, as somebody, I was at DWP uh, uh, during COVID and so HSE was part of our remit and you know, how they reacted and responded in terms of you know, getting out there, advising people, recognizing that people want to do the right thing. And I think, you know, that, that is a cultural thing. That's a cultural change. And I think that is one of the things that the financial regulators really need to think of is actually a lot of their focus is, as Gerald says, it, it's quite backward looking. It's about ensuring that harm isn't done, which, you know, of course you want to prioritize, but at the same time, that sense of how do you support businesses to grow, to prosper, that being part of their remit, and that being part of their culture, rather than you simply waiting for them to tell you that you've done something wrong. And you know, you would hope that the change in objectives, the point of the change in objectives is to, is to in actually bring about that cultural change. You know, uh, that, that sense of actually we're here to help we're here to support, I think, you know, is, is one of the things that would make, I think, a big difference to the regulatory agenda here in the UK. Yeah, I was going to say, certainly if one looks at it, given that you mentioned small firms, but if one looks at it in terms of individuals, we now have pension freedom. Coming back to a point Bim was talking about, of tax simplification, which is the theme, maybe underlying theme of the new government, that's a key issue in this area. But the UK, you mentioned the UK is the fourth biggest insurance market or something like that. We're the second biggest wealth market globally, so there's a big pool of retail assets that can be put to work. But there is a big sort of gap in terms of the advice that people receive. So it's not for the regulators to close that gap, but they need to facilitate the environment in which uh, people have access to that and firms can provide it. Um, more transparency, like the great thing about MIFID is that you transparency on fees is there, but um, people probably need to become more aware in terms of savvy about finance. But I think the regulators can facilitate that environment. A, a welcome break for the politicians on the panel, but maybe that will we'll end with our next question. Well, I was going to say, um, there was a regulator that's been missed, and that's the ICO. And they've actually um, have so much work on as well with GDPR from all different sectors of the economy. Um, is there something that we could do to either free up the ICO um, in, and make it easier for the digital transformation that we need in financial services? Or do we need to split it and create different ICOs for different sectors of the economy? I mean, I'm happy to, to take that. I, mean, I don't know that much about the ICO, I must confess. Uh, and I know all of you will be experts on it. However, I do know a bit about GDPR, and it's really damaging. I think that 
of all the pieces of legislation that have been through the House since I've been elected in what appears to be a very, very long five years, <laughs> is, is, is a reform of GDPR. We need to do it. It is inhibiting sensible business activity. It inhibits sensible government activity. And it's a very good example of when you import something wholesale from another jurisdiction where they operate in a different way into a common law parliamentary system, it doesn't translate very well, and I think it's a ve it's if a reform of GDPR could do a lot for improving business uh, confidence, uh, economic growth, a lot more than a lot of other things that we spend a lot of time worrying about. So I think I don't know about the ICO, but I do think GDPR needs to be Im improved significantly. Anyone else have anything on that? Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. Um, either the well, de depending on who's closest to the microphone, Elizabeth, you make your selection. Thank you. Um, in the sort of theme of tax simplification to drive uh, increased investment and growth in the economy, um, would it not be a better approach for the government to continue the pensions, freedoms, liberalisation that I think Gerald or Pim, you mentioned, removing the lifetime allowance and the annual allowances to Im improve investment but without fueling inflation, so helping the supply side of the economy, um, or is that now politically impossible given the events of the last uh, week? That's for the politicians, then. <laughs> well, I took GDPR. Gareth, what do you think? <laughs> Be beautifully done. Beautifully done. <laughs> if I'd have known that, I'd have taken GDPR. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, this has come up a few times, and I think we should look seriously at it. I think we should look seriously at anything that will boost investment and growth in our country, um, no matter how politically... Um, mm popular it is as a principle but uh, timing is everything so um, uh, I'm sure the ministers are looking at that specific proposal. Can I point, come back to Ben's point? Uh, it, tax can only be an incentive if somebody understands it. I don't know that many people who understand pensions tax you know and I work in the industry you know so the idea that that people are making the right decisions because they they can understand the system is just not true. I, you know, if you want a system which incentivizes savings, then people have to understand it. So there has to be more simplification. When that is and how it's done, I think you know that's a matter for government. But I think there's very few people that would think, look at the pensions tax system and think, well, that's well designed. Your question was specifically about the cap going as well, wasn't it? Yeah. So what's the unintended consequence of the cap? People start buying second homes and stuff like this, and yeah. distorts the market. So, yeah. So yeah. there's lots of unintended consequences whenever governments intervene. That's the challenge. Yeah. Um, any further um, The gentleman right at the front here wanted to... Uh, Thank you. Uh, Ricardo Cordera from the Payments Association. We want to go back to the crypto as well and also enlarge to digital currencies as a whole. Uh, crypto, clearly, it's easy to say that crypto is dodgy because there is no regulation, but let's not forget that every time you move tran you transfer assets to crypto, you do it from a bank account. So it depends on the regulation of the country where the bank is. So if you do it in the West, we tend to have pretty good regulation. To that extent, the European Union has done the MICA regulation, and we are clearly losing out because in this country there is no framework for this whatsoever, which means that everyone who is operating into this space makes agreement with the European Union and not with the UK, and we are losing on the regulatory arbitrage that should be one of our main things, particularly after Brexit. And in digital currencies as a whole, China has launched the digital yuan. This will scrap the entire payment system entirely because it's going to be offered as a platform that's able to settle instantly money everywhere in the world. And they have a clear plan which is announced and available for everyone to read of offering this technology to all the Belt and Road Initiative countries. So we e easily understand what this means for the West, which is why he was mentioning before the, digital, the um, executive order that Biden has done to say, OK, well, now we have to fix this and look at this in a Western perspective because the Chinese solution is clearly anti-democratic because of the design of how the central bank digital currencies is done. So that's something that, I mean, the government and uh, the Bank of England have been working on this for two years, but Thanks, it's so slow. We need more, and we need now. Anyone want to 
this one. So I don't know enough about the specifics on crypto that you talked about, but as I said, I need to study this this at greater depth. Uh, in greater depth, and the Treasury Select Committee, of which I sit, I know is going to look at this. So perhaps we can have a conversation offline about that. I will just say on um, central bank digital currencies. I think there are now 83 countries globally that are now looking at this, including our own. You mentioned the Bank of England and Treasury work that's going on and yet to, to reach a conclusion. But I think there are both pros and cons uh, to this. Um, I, I actually I see a lot of pros in it, um, it particularly around financial inclusion, uh, and uh, look forward to the outcome of that. It's really interesting in terms of the approach things could go on this, because post the invasion of Ukraine, effectively we had an immediate geopolitical G3 emerge, America and its allies, China and its allies, but the third group was the complete non-aligned group, who included lots of Commonwealth countries, Africa, in countries across Africa, India, Pakistan. Yeah, so as you say, Russia's piloting through China, yeah. And the fact that the central bank reserves of Russia were frozen was worrying uh, for many people because it suggested politics superseded um, what was a normal accepted norm. The UK requ uh, requisitioned a yacht in Canary Wharf that everyone thought was great news but suddenly led to a big inflow of money into Dubai, it's alleged, if you read the national newspaper there, etc. So unintended consequences from this. So the UK is, London is in a very competitive position from place to be able to do business from, but how the structure starts to change if someone like China gets the lead in crypto, etc. Not everyone will go down that route, of course, but it's a complex environment. But you're right, we should be very much more on the front foot on many of these issues, regardless of the geopolitics. Um, can, so, uh, can I use the chair's prerogative to, to ask one sort of overall question, which will hopefully, uh, hopefully, be interesting to everyone and potentially even wrap up the, the, the discussion, which is going back to the point about, and it, it springs off that that question: Can the city seize the opportunity to Brexit? What, if you had to summarise, what would you say the the sectors are, the areas are, and the countries, and and so both sort of, both sort of in terms of the market and in terms of geography, what are the areas that we that Savvy, savvy investors sitting in this audience should be thinking the, you know, the UK should pile into there. You know, this is this is where the profits are. This is where our, we're going to we're going to grow and secure the future the future of the city. Um, I'll take I'll take it first. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Bim, you. Um, something I meant to say at the beginning that hasn't come up though. Gerard did mention it is professional services, which are all part of the city as well. Uh, trade in services. So whenever we think about trade deals. We always think about goods, right? It's like natural way how it works. The WTO rule book is based around goods. Uh, but actually, for a country like this country, where our sort of competitive edge is largely in services sector, particularly focused around the City of London, if we can do two things. One, with all of our trade deals going forward, have specific chapters relating to services and improve what we've done so far, that can benefit this country pretty much more than any other country in the world. And secondly, at WTO level, we need to start to work for services liberalization at that level. Because, and let me explain why this matters, right? I'll give you a very practical example. There's a trade deal being negotiated with India at the moment. I've no idea how the progress of it and, and how close we are and what the provisions are. However, it is not possible to say, say a British firm, a law firm I used to work for, say Freshfields, cannot just set up fresh fields India today. They can't do that. There are regulatory barriers for them doing so. If they were permitted to do that, that would be of big benefit to this country, even if that office obviously was in India, it was employing Indian lawyers, etc. And you can all appreciate that. A bit like if you're able to move your goods tariff-free to India, it improves your export opportunity because you make more money. I pick that very small thing, but that thing alone could be worth, if we improve services trade with every single trade agreement that we do in this country, it could be more beneficial than almost everything else that we do internationally. We need to think about that. And by the way, I include the European Union with that, though I fear the European Union with their, uh, with their attitude may well be a bit tricky for, for a few years to come. But, but I just think that that is of significant benefit to us and it doesn't get enough purchase. 
Well, let's, let's go along the, along the road there, Gerard. Yeah, um, actually, the WTO point is very important because we always talk about hard power and soft power, but institutional power is very important as well. In the UK, I completely echo what you've said. Uh, look, I don't think we should be picking sectors, but regions of the globe, Indo-Pacific, from India in the West to America in the East, is the dynamic growth path. Uh, and the UK is positioning itself well there in that Trans-Pacific trade deal. The world economy, beginning of this century, was $32 trillion in size. Despite all the negativity, this year the world economy is over $100 trillion in size. Obviously, some of that is demographics, but it's, the world economy is still growing. Western Europe is the slow growth region, and we need to, in Britain, try and break out of that slow growth phase. So making London competitive in its own right, there's a good place to do business from, I think goes without saying. Picking the sectors, I think everyone will have their own view. And of course, although in insurance would obviously be top oh, of the list well, for everyone. Well, yeah. Out, yeah. Clearly. Um, so I was, was going to make the point just about regulation. You, the things that have come up in the conversation are things like crypto, data, ESG, um, you know, uh, the fact that we now are in charge of our own regulation, the, we need to be speedier. Yeah. We need to be quicker at coming up with systems and implementing them. We don't have 27 countries that we have to agree with anymore. So having something which is UK specific, which works for us, you know, ha making sure that we are using that to our advantage. Brilliant. And, um, and Gareth? Yeah, we're already a global leader in FX, right? And yeah. um, the and same with FinTech. Um, largest market for asset management in Europe, second largest in the world. So we're, we're building off a strong base. And so for me, as, as Bim was saying, you know, there needs to be a greater emphasis on services trade. I actually don't think that's through um, broad um, FTAs. It's through very specific agreements. Um, and I would focus laser-like on New York and, and the United States more broadly. Um, particularly for two reasons. One is that the New York Stock Exchange are kind of eating our lunch. They, you know, all the all the big fast-growing companies in our country go off and list on the New York Stock Exchange. The Financial Services Bill will help with that and implementing the Hill uh, suggestions, but we do need to be really careful about that and think about that very care um, in a much more careful way. The second is on ESG. Uh, this has been a major issue for the last five years in the industry. Uh, now we have an opportunity actually to think about the regulators around the world and where we're most aligned on things like ESG. And I would argue that we are more aligned with the United States than we are the European Union on ESG. And if you put together the UK and US asset management markets, we are the globe, by far the global dominant market. And we, we basically have a global market there. So we can set the standard for the rest of the world. We don't need to do it with the European Union. We can go uh, and meet with the SEC and others um, to set the ESG standards uh, for everybody else. And I think we should look at that. Brilliant. Well, yes, we don't need the Europeans. Let's just go to America. That's the, that, that's the message I got, uh, I got from that. Uh, <laughs> dignified silence. Um, thank you all very much for, for joining us. Um, thank you very much to the ABI for supporting this event. Um, quick housekeeping, please uh, follow the CPS, subscribe to and the CapEx on social media, subscribe to the CapEx newsletter, which offers a digest of five brilliant stories every day um, on politics, technology, business, uh, economics. Uh, you can get you. There will, there will be some swag on your way out. There is. You can get your a selfie with <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, our glorious co-founder, uh, if you if you yeah. feel so inclined. And um, please join us again at two o'clock to hear Dr. Frank Luntz answer the question: Is America doomed? Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.